Read a story about a preacher one time who went to the hospital to visit a patient in the ICU. The patient was in fairly critical condition, and the preacher was bent over his bed talking to him like I've done hundreds, if not thousands of times. And, it, and as he was talking to him, he noticed the guy was struggling to say much else. And he actually really started struggling. He grabbed a notepad from the side of his bed and wrote out a note and handed it to the preacher. But the preacher realized he was struggling and decided not to read it. He just stuffed it in his pocket and said a quick prayer and left. After he left, a few hours later, he got a phone call from the patient's family saying he had died shortly after the preacher had left. And the preacher was so sad, and they set the funeral service, and he went to the funeral service, and the preacher was preaching the man's funeral, and he was talking about his last words and how important last words are. And so he realized at that moment he had this note that this guy had written. That would have been his last words in his pocket. And he reached into his pocket and pulled out a piece of paper and said, I have a piece of paper here that contains the last words of our brother. But he never read it. Because the dead man had written, you are standing on my oxygen tube. Well, 2 Timothy <laughs> chapters 3 and 4, <laughs> yeah, you can clap, go ahead, that's, no, no, <laughs> 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4 are Paul's last words. I mean, he knows he's going to die in a matter of weeks or months, maybe even days. And so of all recorded scripture, it is the last words that he is going to write, and I've tried to picture in my mind as I was working on the lesson, Timothy receiving the scroll, and who knows, he might have received the scroll after Paul was already dead. And he unwraps the scroll that are going to be the last words that he's ever going to read from his beloved mentor, Paul. And as he looks at it, he reads words like this. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and unholy. In the last days, there are going to be savage times, Paul told Timothy. Society will grow worse, not better. And as we look through this list this morning of what Paul said about how society will become, I want you to count down with me which of these are present right now, today. People will be lovers of themselves. Folks will be self-absorbed. They will worship their own desires. How many think that describes the majority of people today? Raise your hand. People will be lovers of money. They'll put money often above conscience, above conviction, friendship, family, and even God. How many of you would say that today people are overwhelmingly lovers of money? Raise your hand. They will be boastful, proud, abusive, boastful to the point that they will brag they no longer need God. Before Christmas this past year, a couple of months ago, I read about a local atheist group in Madison, Wisconsin, who erected a sign next to the city's official Christmas tree. The sign read, at this season of the winter solstice, may reason prevail. There are no gods, no devils, no angels, no heaven or hell. There is only our natural world. Religion is but myth and superstition that hardens hearts and enslaves minds. Freedom from religion foundation on behalf of its state members. But here's what's interesting. What is very interesting is as that's next to the Christmas tree, 
just below it is a sign that says, thou shalt not steal. They put it there. They put it there. The atheist group was concerned that their sign might get stolen, so they had printed on the side of a sign, thou shalt not steal. It's amazing that the people who blaspheme God and his word and his commandments still lean on his laws to protect their own assets and self-interest. Atheists mock the idea of God, but without his moral standards of right and wrong, they cannot possibly construct an orderly world worth living in. It's been proven over and over again throughout history. Life turns into chaos. And in the last days, people will be disobedient to their parents. How many think that might be a bit of a problem today? Raise your hand. None of the kids are ready. Get your hands down over here. Get those hands, get those hands down over here. But I'm trying to help you now. I'm trying to protect you now. But today's culture mocks parental authority and glamorizes rebellion. And we have seen that repeatedly in the last few years. Disputing authority is viewed almost like a rite of passage. And a parent who hopes to teach his child respect for authority will certainly not get any help from the society, the culture, or the school. People will be ungrateful and unholy without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, and brutal. How about that term, brutal? Well, according to the FBI's 2022 crime clock in America, just in America, a violent crime is committed every 26.3 seconds. You want to count that out? A murder takes place in America every 32 minutes. A rape occurs in America every 3.8 minutes. We live today in a truly brutal, violent society. And what would you expect after sampling the brutality on television, the internet, and in our games that particularly our kids and young adults play? David Walsh, the president of the National Institute of Media and Family, said, It is tragically ironic that at the very time we are wringing our hands about violent behavior among young people, we are simultaneously entertaining them with that same violence. And folks will become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of of God. How many think that is a problem today? Raise your hand. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. If ever there was a statement that fits modern America, this is it. People live today for the weekend, but not to go to church and pray like they once did, but to go out and party and play. People may say they love God, but they love pleasure far far more. And the numbers of people who participate in pleasurable activities on weekending, as opposed to the numbers of people who worship God in church, continue to go just like this, just like this. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God Verse 5 continues Paul's last days analysis. Remember, he said these are the things that will happen in the last days. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Realize 
You can be a lover of yourself, a lover of money, proud, boastful, headstrong, everything Paul warns us about in this text, and still be religious. It's a form of godliness. He is attaching a form of godliness here to everything that came before. You can do all those things and still have a form of godliness. You can clothe yourselves in religious accessories, yet deny God's transformative power in your life. People embrace the formality without the force, the power. People embrace the liturgy without the life-giving behind it. They have a form of God. But it's not godliness. Realize, my friends, the only way to battle that is to be word-centric. You never graduate from the Bible. You don't study it for a semester and then send it back to the bookstore like you do your college textbooks. It's your curriculum for life in the Bible. And it's all that we need to sustain a right relationship with God and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the reason why we've been intensive on trying to study this Love Your Bible program. And we're going to leave it out there for new people coming in that they can get it in multiple forms. And, and we, we want you to continue to go back to it over and over and over again because the Word of God reveals the will of God and we will only have a form of godliness unless we submit to the Word and the will of God. And so the next text says, All Scripture is God-breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God breathed. The Bible is literally the words of God. Certain sections are not more God breathed than others. That's why I almost always teach expository here, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Don't skip anything. Leviticus is just as inspired as Luke. There are truths we can glean from all of the Bible, and it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. Not only is all Scripture inspired, but it's profitable in every way for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. Doctrine is what is to believe. Correction is what not to believe. Instruction is how to live. Reproof is how not to live. And the Bible accomplishes all four of these tasks simultaneously. And the Word of God has been given to us so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so Paul is writing his last words and testimony his last will to his young mentee, Timothy, he's leaving a lot on him, a lot of stuff that's important. And so he heads off into what we know as the final chapter. And he says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Jesus is returning someday to judge the earth, every soul who's ever lived. And so we have to be prepared for that, he reminds Timothy. Sort of reminds me of the lady one time who was accused of a crime and she was guilty. And she knew she needed a crack defense attorney. And a lawyer was recommended and she wrote down his name and address, but she delayed in contacting him. And she kept delaying and delaying and putting it off and putting it off. When her trial date drew closer, where she couldn't put it off any longer, she called the attorney. But sadly, it was too late. He explained that he had just gotten a call a week earlier and that he would have been happy to take her case a week ago. But two days previously, he had been appointed judge. Instead of being her advocate, 
her lawyer, he was now her judge. And this, my friends, is going to happen to millions, if not billions of people who right now can have Jesus Christ standing beside them at the right hand of God, interceding for them, being their lawyer, being their attorney, pleading to God on their behalf. And they keep putting it off, and they keep putting it off, and they don't do it when he's willing to plead our case and secure God's mercy and pardon and forgiveness for us. And then... He's going to be the judge, the judge. We need to proclaim God's power and God's word with as much persuasion as we possibly can muster. That's why this text says convince, rebuke, encourage, teach, stay at it, don't give up. Here's a point, my friends, that none of us ever want to see. My friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth, I walked with you day by day, and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell me the story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me straight to him. Though we lived together on earth, you never told me of the second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend and trusted you. But I learn now that it's too late. You could have saved me from my fate. We all have friends who need Jesus for whom these first verses of chapter 4 apply to us. Stay committed to the living word, Jesus, and to the written word to the end of your earthly life and to illustrate perseverance, Paul then said. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. Graduation day is right around the corner for Paul. He knows it. He's about to depart from this world and be with Christ. He says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. And notice this. Paul's life wasn't taken from him. It had already been given to God and poured out all over others. You can't take from me what I no longer possess. In athletic terminology... Paul had left it all out on the field, given his all to Jesus, was passing into eternity with no regrets, and he speaks of his impending execution, not as death, but as a time of departure. And that word's always intrigued me. Why didn't he just say what he meant? Why didn't he just say death? So I looked it up, and I did a deep study on the word departure And there are at least four definitions that could be taken from this word in the original language. One is to hoist an anchor and set sail. That's what Paul was doing. He was heading for new waters. Another was to take down a tent. That is the most likely meaning because if you know Paul's writings in the New Testament, he often talked about this body as a tent and, you know, and God is building us an eternal mansion not made with hands. And so that one's the most common, most likely. Paul's physical body is just a tent. It's a temporary dwelling. He's about to take down the tent permanently. The next means to free a prisoner. Death for Paul was going to be literally freeing a prisoner. God's jailbreak. It was God's means of delivering him from prison and persecution to paradise. But a fourth meaning of that word departure could be to unyoke an ox. Paul had spent 30 years of tireless service. Now he's entering his rest. And so he says in the next words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. 
I have kept the faith. He's like a marathoner crossing the finish line or a fighter going the distance all 15 rounds. He refuses to tap out. He's about to break the tape. All his Christian life he ran to win, and now the stretching and the straining will finally be rewarded. What a moment. What a moment. Be free. There was a little boy one time who received a yellow parakeet as a birthday gift, and he was painting its cage with varnish, and he had a full can of varnish next to him, and when he reached inside to remove the bird, the parakeet fell in the varnish and drowned, and it was tragic, and he was terribly upset. He was in tears, and his older brother found him and comforted him as only an older brother can. He said, cheer up, little buddy. At least your bird had a good finish. I, I, it doesn't affect me at all if you boo. Really, it doesn't. And here is Paul finishing well. He's fought. He's run. He's kept the faith. And don't gloss over how Paul viewed his life. He didn't say, turn out the lights, the party's over. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Boy, did he. He fought Judaizers and Gnostics. He fought illnesses and weariness, people stoning him to death and leaving him for dead, jealous people, pagan people, greedy people, physical assaults, personal attacks, vicious lies, churches denying him, friends turning against him. His Christian life had been nothing but a fight. But he finished, and the winner of a fight always receives a belt, a crown, an award. And so did he, according to his next words. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Two types of crowns are mentioned in Scripture. The Greek terminology is diadema, and Stephanos, the diadem, was the king's crown. It was inherited rather than earned, if you've watched the TV show, The Crown. But the Stephanos, or the laurel, was the victor's wreath. It was given to the winners at the Olympic Games and also at the Isthian Games, which were held in Corinth and worn by conquering generals when they won a battle over another nation. This is the reward that is mentioned here. The reward Paul expects is the Stephanos of righteousness. The Bible teaches that crowns are passed out to Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord himself rewards believers. Some receive more than others. There are special crowns for elders who serve well. It's all through the book of 1 Peter. So, but anyway, for the, rest of the first, uh, for the rest of the chapter, Paul is going to be reminding how important it is to finish well. In verse 9, he writes to Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly. Paul's legal proceedings weren't going so well. His appeals were almost exhausted. An execution date would be set and set very soon. Paul wanted to see his truest son in the faith one last time. Do your best to come quickly. Did he come? We don't know. We have absolutely no record of that, whether he made it. But verse 10, and this is key, and I've only got about five minutes left, but pay attention to these five minutes because this is key. Verse 10 tells us why it's so vital that, that Timothy come to him. Because Demas has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas was once a trusted ally of Paul. He's mentioned two other times in New Testament books as workers that Paul appreciated. But the world stole his heart. Demas sold his soul to selfish desires. And I 
think, I think I know Demas' last words just before he bailed out. They're not in the Bible. They're not in Scripture. But I think I know them because I've heard them so many times in my ministry. I just want to be happy. Not long ago, I ran into somebody out in public here at an event that used to be a member of our church. I talked to them. I I said, invite them back. And they said, you know, I have left my wife. I've left my fa- that family. I know I've sinned and done wrong, but I just want to be happy. I just want some happiness. I think that's probably what Demas said. But that's not what he meant, and that's not what the fellow that I ran into meant either. What he meant was, I just want to drink and drug whenever I want to. I just want to be free from responsibility. I'm tired of my job. I was tired of my wife. I was tired of my kids' rebellion and disrespect, even though he had created their disrespect. Life had gotten hard, and he wanted to be happy rather than deal with the hard. And so you want to just be able to say something like this. Hey, Demas, regardless of how attractive it may sound, escaping God-given responsibilities is not anyone's ticket to happiness. It's not. Demas swapped his commitments for a few jollies because he loved this present world more. But there was no satisfaction in that. Or in the fellow I spoke with, because on top of his emptiness and search for his happiness, he had lost child alimony, child support, shame, guilt, the loss of his children's respect, and his faith. Life is a fight with or without Jesus. Without Jesus, life is a wild goose chase with no goose. But with Jesus, there's a prize worth having after the fight. So here are these two men. In this last words that Paul ever writes in the canon of Scripture. There's Paul. There's Demas. There's Paul, I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. There's Demas, I have deserted the Lord because of the pleasures of the world Paul talked about back in the beginning of chapter 3. Here's these two men, Paul, Demas, which are you more like? Which do you want to be more like? Did you hear about the three guys discussing their obituaries? And one said, what would you like folks to say at your wake just before your funeral? And one of his buddies thought for a minute and said, I'd like them to say he was a great communitarian that cared about his community. The second fellow said, I think I'd like them to say he was a great husband and father who was an example for many to follow. And those two nodded soberly in agreement as they looked to the third one who hadn't said anything yet, who finally spoke up and said, I think I'd like them to say, look, he's moving. (laughs) You're right. But really, for all of us, there is a day that is coming when you're not going to be moving 
trust me, I've been around the mortuaries and the funeral business. They take care of that. There's a day coming for all of us where we're not going to be moving. And we are either going to be Paul or Demas. No in between. No in between. We are either going to have fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith, or we will have abandoned God for the pleasures of this world. And the choice is yours. It's always yours. 